And a good morning, Sunny Hills, on this Sunday, January the 17th. Our drive-in service continues live on Sundays at 9 o'clock in the Upper Church parking lot. And something new, starting the first week of February, we will be having a group of Sunny Hills singers singing for us at this service live and in person. So please come join us. That starts on Sunday, February 7th. Wednesday night's Bible study with Randy is on Zoom at 6 o'clock, and the youth group Bible study is on Zoom Thursday at 6 o'clock. Hey, do you want to learn to paint a masterpiece right in your own home? Well, I'm glad you asked, because we're having a Zoom paint night on Thursday, the 11th of February at 6 p.m. Now, this is for kindergartners through college age, and Madi will be providing the supply kit. All you need to do is pick up the kit at the church office starting on Monday, February 1st. Now, here's the disclaimer. Madi is not responsible for cleanups or for any paint fights. You do understand, I'm sure, with the COVID and all. All right. Brenda asked that any expenses that you may have incurred in 2020 that you either want to be reimbursed for or that you want to have added to your yearly donation statement to please contact her. She needs you to update your uh, home mailing address since this year, since we can't get together, she will be mailing those annual statements to you via the post office. The Kids Experience premieres each Sunday at 11 a.m. on the church's website and on Facebook. There's one for preschool and one for the elementary schoolers. You can find the Parents Guide on the church website, shcoc.org. If you would like to support our Sunny Hills Church, you can mail your check to the church office, or you can give online directly through your bank account, or you can use the link on the church website. Thanks very much for joining us today. Have a great week. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Therefore I will hope in him. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name. in our praises as your people declare your mighty works blessed be the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come blessed be the Lord God Almighty who reigns forevermore Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. I sing praises to your name, O Lord. Praises to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, praises to your name, O to your name, O oh Lord, glory.
glory to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O family. You probably have all heard the saying, uh, you are what you eat. You know, it's a proverbial saying that, well, the notion is that to be fit and healthy, you need to eat good food. It also suggests that if you eat poorly, then your health may suffer. The origin of this phrase comes from a French lawyer who in 1826 wrote, tell me what you eat and I will tell you what you are. Then in a German essay around 1863 or 1864, um, a gentleman wrote, man is what he eats. Now both of these sayings, and they're stating is that the food one eats has a bearing on one state of mind and health. Uh, these phrases um, didn't migrate into other languages until decades later. The phrase, you are what you eat, emerged into in, in English in the 1930s when the American nutritionist Victor Lindlar, who was a strong believer in the idea that food controls health, developed the catabolic diet. The phrase wasn't much used in the years that followed, but regained popularity in the 1960s, when the hippie generation adopted the phrase as a slogan for healthy eating. Now, why do I bring this up? I believe this concept is also true for our spiritual health. We need to be wary of what we allow into our minds and hearts if we willingly allow negative images, thoughts, actions into our lives, it will eat away at our souls and impact how we live and how we relate to others. I believe this is what Paul was conveying um, in his letter to the Philippians. If we look in chapter 4, verses 4 through 8, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, pre present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. As we partake of the bread and cup, let us clear our minds of the worldly things and, and focus our thoughts on God and his love for us and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. For we do this in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to this earth to die for our sins. But we thank you most of all, Lord, that he was raised from the dead so that he can be our living Savior. And all we have to do is accept that gift that, he, that you have given to us. Lord, help us to keep good things in our minds, as it says in Philippians, Lord, and, uh, and to be able to clear the, the bad things and, and be able to focus on you and your righteousness. Lord, I pray you be with us, and we thank you again, thank you again, Lord. I pray this in your son, Jesus' name, amen.
God bless you, and I hope to see you soon. Good morning, Sunny Hills Church. Uh, happy Sunday. Uh, we're glad you're here and all those visiting with us, uh, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and wherever else you're, you're coming to us. We're, uh, we're, we're glad you're here. We hope you're blessed so far by this service. Um, today, we want to continue with this idea I began talking about last week. Uh, what were you thinking? Or at least um, challenging the way we think from a worldly perspective um, with a kingdom perspective. And so last week we looked at the worldly perspective that suggests that we can, we can just change it all by our willpower. We can just get it done. And if we just, if we just decide to do it, we can. And uh, when we saw, saw in the Bible that really transformation comes by the renewing of the mind. It comes because we're filled with the Holy Spirit, because we're, the Word of God is in us and Jesus is in us and we see Jesus and we know him and we're becoming like him. And this is where transformation comes from. And a, a text I didn't quote, but it came to my mind, was in uh, uh, Galatians 2, where Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. But not I. Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is, this is how we are transformed. This is how we become different. So different way of thinking, a, a different perspective about where transformation comes from. It comes from the Lord. Uh, so today, I, we're thinking about uh, the kingdom perspective as we participate in uh, maybe public discourse, as uh, we cooperate with one another in this particular setting in America, in our particular culture, and, and sort of the things that are going on right now. Um, a great theologian, one of the greatest theologians of the last century, uh, Karl Barth, is credited with the idea that a preacher should preach always with the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Of course, I don't get the newspaper. I read my news on online and, and watch it on TV and I get my news sources that way. Um, and and as, I think, as I think about the wisdom of that, it probably was very wise in his day, maybe still today, but, but how difficult it is <laughs> preaching with a, a newspaper on the other hand. Because the question that comes to my mind immediately is what, which newspaper, like which source, which website? Um, the... It's all boiled down to two narratives. <laughs> and they're so polarized that, that they have nothing in common. Uh, something like, uh, either you believe that uh, Satan has been in the White House and has done the most damage of any person ever in history, or, uh, or, or not. You believe that some kind of a savior has been in the White House who's done more for America than anybody in history. And... And uh, that I may be hyperbolizing a little bit, maybe pushing it further to the polls. But I, for some people, I don't think so. Uh, that's a pretty close ass assessment to the way some people are talking. And it, it's, it's, it's not too unfair to the way a lot of people are talking. Um, but that's my question. It's like, which newspaper? And it's not just in that, not just relating to that one subject, but all other subjects seem to flow in the same vein. And so these approaches are just... Two completely different, like, mindsets. And it, it's, in our, it's in our churches. I, I have uh, friends who are uh, preachers in the Church of Christ, and they, uh, I see them online. They've, uh, both the men I'm thinking of right now have done many lectures at Pepperdine, at the lectures, and, and I've been to their classes, and they're uh, spiritual men. They love Jesus. They, uh, they know the Bible. And, uh, and so they... they they have a lot to say on uh, places like Facebook. But if you read one of them, all of the narratives coming forth seem to fit the one side of the worldview. One worldview. <laughs> one narrative. Uh, the, and then you read the other preacher, and it just all fits uh, the other narrative altogether. Just completely different narrative. And both of them are speaking to people about where a Christian ought to be and, and where God is and what God is doing and, and how we ought to participate in the world and we ought to be thinking of these things that they're saying and they are on completely opposite ends of these, these, these polarized debates and it's, it's troubling. I just posted this morning, I, I just wanted to post a quote I saw 
from Barack Obama that said uh, something about free speech. That uh, his his point was uh, the the corrective to 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 wrong speech or bad speech or or whatever. The corrective is more speech, not repressed speech. That that uh, free speech is really a good thing. Um, and so I posted that, but it just became a, it just became a lot of words. People fighting about how they feel about the, the president. And so I just deleted that. I, I didn't want all that free speech. So I guess uh, maybe I don't like free speech as much as I thought I did. But I do like it. I just don't always want it on my on my page. <laughs> and and the same thing over and over. I just they can they can debate that somewhere else. But anyway, uh, it's it's that close, and it's not just in those preachers. It's uh, it's in members. I, I have lots of uh, friends who are Christians on Facebook, and and I have a Bible study with like seven thousand members. We don't allow political debate there, and if it starts to get political, we just exit out. No more of that, uh, because we're just trying to discuss the Bible there. And uh, but a lot of Christians, and I see it's it's in Christians and completely polarized. People I love, people I think are intelligent and they love Jesus and they have completely different views. And and I know it's in families. I, I know that families, even like my own, <clears throat> families that have uh, completely different views about what's going on. And in, in all these streams of, of things, not just uh, presidential things, but everything related to that, related to COVID, related to everything, just seems to fall into two camps. And it's just so divided, it's horrible. And we have to, Christians need to have a place. We need to know our place in all of that. And, uh, and there was one preacher in the Church of Christ who I, who I really appreciate because I, I find him trying to speak a kingdom perspective into the divisiveness. Um, uh, you, you, uh, you know Brian Fatosik, Tracy Himes' husband? Um, uh, if you're not friends with him on Facebook and you're on Facebook, uh, be friends with him. He, he says, uh, he quotes and says some really good stuff. I, I love what he writes. I share it often, so you may have read some of this. But in one of his quotes, he said, in the vast majority of cases, I don't think Christians should consider people with different political views their enemy. Here's the point. But even if we did, this is the point, because sometimes we seem to, but even if we did, we are required by Jesus to bring our thoughts, actions, and emotions toward them into alignment with his words in Luke 6, 27, 28. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. <clears throat> That's kingdom perspective. That's healing. That's helpful. That's, that's recognizing that there are good people on, on each side trying to do the right thing, trying to do what they believe God wants. And, and instead of, you know, villainizing everybody that doesn't agree with us, we need to find common ground. We need to be able to talk to each other and, uh, and come to a kingdom perspective. Um, So it's important to know what God is wanting from the church. Well, what is God, <coughs> excuse me, it's a nuisance. What is God wanting us to do and to be in these situations? And, and I, think, I think Brian's got, got, got a handle on it. But what does he want from the church? We've been talking in the last several weeks, and I brought it up before, uh, from the parable of the weeds that, that says Jesus is sowing the sons of the kingdom. Christians are being sown into the world uh, as God's way of, of planting seeds into the world, seeds of his kingdom, to bring about a different spirit, a different motive, a different emotion, that God's, God's people are to, come, to, to reveal a light unto the nations. And, and we get this in Ephesians 3 as well, where, where, where Paul tells us, and, and he's dealing with this large 
um, uh, division between the Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians over circumcision and other things. And, and, and Paul is trying to bring healing. He's trying to say, God, he's broken down that wall of partition. He's, he's bringing you together as one church, as one people of God, in order to put you on display. He, he's manifesting his wisdom through the church, <laughs> through you and me, believe it or not. God has chosen to show his wisdom through you and me into the public spaces, into the world. He's sowing us so that we can be a light in that darkness. There's so much darkness today. People need to see light in that darkness. And so that's what, that's what the ideal is. God is wanting us to be sown into the public spaces as light, as reconciliation. The kingdom of heaven is not a matter of eating and drinking and all the ordinances and rules. It's of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is what God wants to get across. And, and so as, as, we, as we look at our role in that public space, we, this, is, this, is, this is our goal. This is what we're trying to get to. And we, we have to understand um, that even though there are ideas, there's ideologies, there's, there's godly things that, that I see on each side of these polar opposites where people are like, I'm doing this for God and, and this is what God wants of us. There's ideals that they have that are worthy and, and, and these are good people that, that I, I love. I think are, they're intelligent and, and they want what God wants. And those ideals they're pushing for are in the Bible. But we've got to come to understand that in, in the economy of things, in Jesus' economy of things, everything is not equal. Everything's not at the same level of importance. Uh, this is why we'll have somebody asking, what's the greatest command? All commands are not the same. They're not equal. And so Jesus will say, and you know, what's the greatest command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. But it's sort of two, but it's one. Because to love God is to love your neighbor. They're like the same. And, um, and so Jesus would say in John 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Or if you, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Another version. But... Either way, he's saying, and here's my command. He boils it all down to one. This is the highest command. This is it. This is everything. Love your neighbor as yourself. This, this is what we have to understand is there's, there's a hierarchy of these things. And sometimes these other things we're really committed to, we can't sacrifice the higher things to get across the, these other things, even though they're, they're important. We see this in Jesus' treatment of the Sabbath. There's no question that Jesus honored the Sabbath. It's the fourth commandment. He, he loved the Sabbath. Of course he honors the Sabbath. The Sabbath honors God. And so he's going to keep the Sabbath. And yet, when there's somebody hurting, and maybe be even being told God hates you, that's why you're hurting. You're, you're lame because God's punishing you for being a sinner. And, and that's hurting this person's relationship with God. In that instance... Jesus is willing to set aside. He's not really breaking the Sabbath, not in his view of it, not his economy of it. He's not breaking the Sabbath, but he is working on the Sabbath, doing something that is more right, that is higher in purpose than just keeping the Sabbath. And he defends it. He says, look at the priesthood. The priesthood works on the Sabbath, when somebody needs to be circumcised, the law of circumcision is higher <clears throat> than just the law of working on the Sabbath. And so priests will work on the Sabbath. They're not really breaking the Sabbath, but if you take it technically, they are. But, but they're not because they're doing the better thing. It's a higher ideal. And that has to be protected. And there's others. He defends it. He says, like when David ate the bread, David and his men were fleeing from Saul and they were being persecuted and, and they had no provisions and it was unjust persecution. And, and they went to the priest, I think it was Abiathar, but they needed bread and he, he let them have the show bread or the, the holy bread, the, the bread that the instructions were, nobody can eat this but the priests. And this was used for the, the temple's uh, sacrifices and, 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 and procedures. And it was, it was most holy stuff. And, and yet, Jesus brings it up, David ate that bread and his men. And, and, and not because he got in trouble, he didn't get in trouble for it. God wasn't mad, there was a higher law, the law of David's life. 
So, so Jesus would say something like the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You have to understand the purpose of these things. So, so all the things we're fighting about, yeah, they, they're probably very important. Or I should say they're very important things. I get that. But Christians have to have a good sense of what are the most important things and rank these things. And not everything is a hill that we're willing to die on or separate, divide over or whatever. We've got to understand this. And so Paul, in telling the church that God's putting you on display, in the very next, like, chapter 4 of Ephesians, he begins, therefore, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That's, That's what he calls the church to do. Make every effort. Yeah, I know you have significant divisions. I know you're you have things to fight about, but make every effort to keep the unity of spirit through the bond of peace. And you, and we might say, well, Randy, but today it's too hard. It's too hard. There's too much. People are just, uh, those guys on that side, they're just morons and they're so deluded and, and they're they're doing hateful things that God hates and he he's going to get them for it. And I'm hearing that from both sides. That's what's crazy. Both sides think that. But this is not the most difficult time for churches. This is not the most difficult time of division that churches have to face in history. There's there's all kinds of examples of times when churches uh, were in very difficult circumstances and were very divided. I just want to throw out one. It was uh, a couple of hundred years after the time of Christ and the early church uh, in, in 250 uh, Anno Domini or Common Era, depending on how you you rank uh, how you describe that those years. But it was the reign of Decius and uh, Emperor Decius, and he had decided everybody should worship him. And they needed to have proof, a, a legal document called a libellus, the plural is libelli. And they had to have this legal document. And it was a document that was it's like a driver's license. It had all your identifying information, uh, your son of whom from the town of, uh, red spot over the eye, I think it's right there. Um, Maybe glasses. I don't know if they had glasses, but there you go. Uh, and and it was signed your name, and it ha- and it had to have a witness, a government official, and it would say that you have participated in this action of worshiping the emperor. And you had to have that. You had to have that libellus in order to be part of the the, the community, to participate in the buying and selling, and and all of that. And in fact, if you didn't have it, there were a variety of consequences you could face. You could be a fine, you could be beaten, you could be imprisoned, and you could be killed. And and many were. There wasn't like a one rule. It was up to the local governors to work all this out. But just imagine what it was like in the church. Imagine the church's experience. There, there were basically five, I think, different experiences with that edict. Uh, some of the Christians just fled. They just split. They went to the, you know, rural areas. <laughs> they got away from the towns and village, uh, villages or cities where there might be uh, any government officials checking on this stuff. And they just fled. And that's what they did uh, to get away from it. Uh, others were called confessors. They went ahead and said, I'm, I can't do that. I serve Jesus and I'm not going to worship the emperor. And and so they 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 some of them didn't suffer any consequences, but some did. Some fines, some imprisonment, some beatings, and some were martyred. So, so some of the confessors were martyred. You got those who fled, you got confessors, and you got some confessors who were martyred, killed for believing and, and not worshiping the emperor. And then a fourth uh, experience was, were those who actually, they wouldn't go through the worship and get the labellus, the labellus that way. They purchased a, fra- a, a, a forged one. They purchased it just so they could have it and still do business and everything. And I guess they figured, figured they were getting away with, you know, not actually violating their honor to Jesus. But then they also had proof that they, you know, to the city that they they didn't, that they were okay. They did the worship, but they didn't. So that was them. Um, and then there were the Christians who actually just went to the government office and went through the process, did the worship, got the labellus. In one account, a governor said there were so many Christians who came to him in a day, he had to tell many of them to come back the next day. He couldn't do that many. And and of those martyred, I should mention, there were a lot of uh, 
actually well-known names of, of bishops, well-known bishops, and also uh, the article I read, uh, Origen, a theologian Origen, died in that persecution. So, so those who were martyred, uh, there were some significant people who died for, for, for not worshiping the emperor. But there were those who just fled, no, no, flooded the governor's office and got that libellus. So here's what I want you to think about. That persecution only lasted about three years. When Decius was gone, everything went sort of back to normal for a while, and people would come back from the rural areas, and, 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 uh, and some people would be let out of prison. And so here's everybody back to church, and they're all hanging out together in their meetings. And think about what it would have been like. Some of the families there, every all their families are there. The, the ones who fled, their families are there. The ones who went and got the libellus, their families are there. The guys who purchased one fraudulently, their families are there. Um, the confessors, their families might be there, but some of them are probably bearing scars. Uh, maybe they're financially strapped because they had to pay huge fines. But there's also the martyrs' families where dad is gone, or maybe the older brother, maybe some children or grandparents or, you know, there's, there's the families that, have, that were, uh, who lost loved ones over it. And here they are, they're all one church. Think about that. Think about how hard it would have been to work through that. And, and so, and that's just one of many examples of how the church has been in a situation where it had to decide how to cooperate as with kingdom priorities, how to make the, the most important things the most important things. Um, somebody would say how to major in the major, majors and, and not major in the minors. Um, and so, so we need to know, okay, then what do we do? How do we do this? How do I approach this? Uh, do I get an example in the Bible? And the answer is yes. Paul actually wants to tell us. He shows us actually how to be sown into the world the way Jesus was sown into the world. And so I want to read from Philippians chapter 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. And that's the, that's, those are the words, but made himself nothing. Five words. Five words that I just want to stick in your mind made himself nothing, nothing. This is how God planted his son into the world to bring about his kingdom. That, that it was done by Jesus making himself nothing. That's where it has to begin. Making himself nothing, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. This is the pathway for Jesus. This is his uh, flight itinerary <laughs> coming from heaven into the earth. His, his destination is made himself nothing to come among us and to try to lead us to God. And it's not going to work with everybody. But, but for those it works for, he made himself nothing to try to reach us. And Paul... You might have noticed this before, but Paul follows Jesus in this way. Look at, I, I, here's three passages where Paul uh, shows us how we can operate in the world. To the very divided Corinthian church, he says, For I am the least, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 9, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Here's Paul, one of the greatest apostles. I think he started the most churches, wrote the most material in here. Well, close. I think Luke, if you put his two books together, is a little bit bigger, but, but still wrote the most number of books uh, to, the, to more churches, uh, was persecuted probably way more times and ultimately gave up his life. This is Paul saying, I'm the least of all apostles. So here's Paul, an apostle of God. He says, I'm the least of all apostles. But not only that, while trying to bring Ephesus together, 
They have the same Jew-Gentile kind of division, and he's trying to heal it and bring them together. And in, in chapter 3, <clears throat> he says, I became a, in verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people. Here's Paul. He's not only the least of all the apostles, but he's less than the least of all God's people. He became nothing. And not just that. You may know another passage like this. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says, Verse 15, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Least of all apostles, least of all God's people, least of all sinners. Paul became nothing. He made himself nothing to try to reach the people in the world and in the church that were so divided, so broken, he became nothing. <clears throat> this is our instruction. This is our path. We've got to let go of our pride. We've got to let go of our need to be right. We've got to put away our egos. And we have to make the highest priority the things that are the highest priority in Scripture unity and love, reconciliation, peace. One more quote I have for you. and It's another preacher I like to read. Uh, he posts a lot. He's a theologian. Uh, he teaches theology at um, Lipscomb University. Uh, his name is John Mark Hicks. And he posted this. <coughs> and I share his post too. But he said, and, and this is instructive for all of us. He said, I asked my fellow believers, whether progressive or conservative, to repudiate violence, speak in measured tones and judicious ways, and seek mutual understanding in order to act in concert for the good of people living in this republic. More importantly, whether progressive or conservative disciples, I hope we are seeking as our single priority to embody the values of the kingdom of God in all of our actions and speech, if we seek first the kingdom of God, we're promised that what we need for life, irrespective of whether we live under an oppressive or a free government or a friendly government. And then he goes on and says, Jesus, as I understand him, calls us to seek peace, to make peace and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. That is a noble but difficult calling. It calls for conviction and determination. Yet it is the calling of those who follow Jesus. To act otherwise is to choose someone or something above the lordship of Jesus. What are we thinking? I hope we're thinking about God's will for our lives, individually and corporately, that we be his seed of his kingdom, the, 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 the seed of his kingdom sown into a world that's filled with, with fighting and divisiveness and slander and, and mocking and, and all of that. You've seen it all. And I pray that we will be instruments, his instruments of peace. Will you pray with me? Holy Father, forgive us for when we have not done this. Raise us up. Our country needs it more than ever to see a unifying force through your people to see Jesus in us. I pray you'll bring that about and that we will humbly submit to that ideal. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.